talked about this with the heart. Remember I said there's always one layer that's in contact with the organ, and then there's the outer layer, and then there's the potential space in between. So again, it's going to be the visceral layer is going to be the one in contact with the lungs, the organ themselves, and the parietal layer is going to be the one contacting the other organs around. So um, that would be called the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. And of course, what's the fluid then going to be called? Pleural fluid. Visceral pleura covers the lungs with a thoracic, uh, with the thoracic cavity on the upper side of the diaphragm are lined by the parietal pleura. The upper side of the diaphragm are lined by the parietal pleura. The parietal pleura is the outer layer, so it's going to contact the, uh, the area and the organs around the lungs, including, like, for instance, the diaphragm. The diaphragm is going to be covered by the parietal pleura. Uh, the intrapleural space, again, this is uh, not an actual space, it's a potential space. There's liquid there, pleural fluid. And you can see a nice diagram. Uh, that's Tension in with thorax, with injury of the lung results in accumulation of air in the pleural space. Um, the problem with that, of course, is because the air is accumulating outside of the lung, it won't allow the, for the lung to expand, which means it won't allow for the alveoli to expand, so it won't allow much air in. <coughs> so what do you have to do? you gotta, you got to get the air out. Okay. Chest decompression is performed starting a large gauge needle. Chest wall ensures to initiate a third intercostal space. Third or fifth? Uh, those. Third intercostal space. Third and fifth. Above the third. Above the third, above the fifth, in the mid axillary line. Is that right? Mid clavicular third. Mid clavicular second. Second. Yeah. Mid third. Second above the third. Mid axillary. So it doesn't read, it doesn't sound right. It doesn't read right. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Do you know why you go just above the rib and not below? <coughs> there, because there's the blood vessels and the nerve right underneath uh, each of the ribs there, and you don't want to go through that. It always goes, um, always goes in the order of the band. Vein, artery, nerve, from top to bottom. So, we always cover that. Okay. What is this showing? Now, see, this is showing uh, below the second, above the third. Okay. Um, you can see up there. Artery, nerve. All the idea is just to get the, the air out. All right, the apex of the lungs, in this case, are at the top, which is really more what you would expect. The heart apex is a little bit different. It was at the bottom. So the base is on the diaphragm. We talked about the, the impression there for the heart. The hilum, I think I, did I talk about the hilum before? The hilum is an area of an organ where everything either goes into or out of the organ. I don't remember if I talked about this before. Okay. Uh, there, there are a lot of organs in our body, a lot of things in our body where there's uh, just one entrance and exit way. So everything goes into or out of that area. It's usually a depressed part of the organ. We see this also most notably in the kidneys. Are going to have that same sort of hilum? You know, if you think of the heart, you have these um, ho these hoses going in and out from all directions. Uh, with the uh, organs that have a hilum, everything is either going into or out of that one space. Okay, the right lung has three lobes, uh, the left lung has two, the fissures are the ones that describe them. On the left lung, the lingua is an area where the middle lobe would be if there was a middle lobe. You can see the different angles, the different areas of each of these. How the bronchi branch off. All 
Remember the thoracic cavity is bordered by the bones of the sternum, and we have the cartilage here, and then we have laterally the ribs, and then we have the vertebral column in the back, and the diaphragm on the bottom. We've already gone over these, right, so I'm not going to go over those again. We've already gone over the ribs, so I'm not going to go over those again. We can see them here. But understand that when we breathe in, how, and I wanted to, I was hoping to have time to show a quick little animation of this. Well, you can see the lungs are going to expand this way, this way, and sort of up. So it goes in several different orientations. And the diaphragm, being this arched uh, muscle, it's actually sort of angled a little bit this way, but it's an arched muscle. And so when that diaphragm gets the signal to contract, to shorten, it flattens out. Now, of course, when I do this, it's a, quite an exaggeration of what's happening, but that gives you an idea. The diaphragm contracting is going to flatten. That's what changes the air pressure inside of the lungs. That's what causes the air to move in. Respiratory control, control centers in the medulla oblongata. Respiratory control centers in the medulla oblongata. I want to say that was on that test. Was it? Maybe, yeah. Was it? Is that where I read it from? Sort of on one of the tests. Sort of on that test. Okay, inspiration, breathing in. Um, active process, when that diaphragm contracts, it has to get a signal. This is, uh, requires energy. Inspiration is an active process, which the diaphragm has sent a signal via the phrenic nerve. I think I even mentioned this before. The phrenic nerve is what causes it to contract. The phrenic nerve it is the phrenic nerve that causes the diaphragm to contract. Phrenic spelled with a PH. Phrenic nerve. Okay. External costal muscles assist by moving ribs up, increase total volume. Exhal exhalation <coughs> is just relaxation. Air passively moves out. Again, they're exaggerating a bit with the flat of the diaphragm, but you get the idea. Did I mention the phrenic nerve? Uh, you can see how the bones, the, the anterior portion of the thorax sort of moves up like that pump on the farm, pumping water, the handle of the pump. Respiratory rate is influenced a lot by the carbon dioxide in our blood. Carbon dioxide levels rise in the blood, that tells our brain, okay, now we've got to get oxygen in. So it tells us to breathe more. Increase CO2 decreases pH. Accessory muscles helping to move air in. Um, also in the back, not just not, to, uh, not just the, uh, in the neck, not just the scaling muscles in the neck, but also in the back. Sternocleidomastoid, micro minor. No. Main accessory muscles of exhalation are the abdominal muscles that push the diaphragm up and back muscles that pull down and compress. Okay. So uh, this is why when you see, this is why people often call some of their core muscles. Um, these are the ones that help sort of maintain uh, the erect posture as well as helping to move air in and out. This is why when they show those people on TV trying to sell you an ab ruler or an ab rocker or an ab climber or an ab twister, and they always show the model who has it, has a six-pack abs. Um, they probably didn't come from using the ab rocker or ab twister or ab ruler. This is why you often see this with people who are runners, do a lot of aerobic exercise, because that really strengthens those muscles as well, not, not uh, of course forgetting the part that it loses weight burns off the fat, burns off the cake. Hypoxic drive and the uh, CO2 gets high. Chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, do we know what these are? Yeah. What was the other one? Emphysema. Chronic bronchitis. Asthma, 
asthma ish. This is one of those things that years ago asthma was not considered part of COPD. And then years later, asthma was considered a component of COPD. Now it's sort of put in its own unique category. Um, so you'll see it back and forth. So depending upon who you're working with, they'll call it different things. Emphysema is what? You, you, know about, you know about emphysema, right? You've heard of emphysema. You actually know what emphysema is. Destruction of the alveoli. So instead of having these collection of balloons that inflate, deflate, and inflate, deflate, if you can think of them that way, instead of having that, you have a big empty space. So if air goes in there, nothing happens. There is no exchange. It just sits there. It's just a big empty space. Which means now there's a part of their lung that is useless. And there's another part over here, and another part over here, and another part over here, and the same in this lung. Which means now when they breathe in, they have a lot less useful lung. Well, if we want to maintain their oxygen uh, levels in their blood, but they have less lung to work with, then we can change the air that's going in, right? That's why emphysema patients are the ones that you always see carrying the little oxygen compressors. They used to, they used to wheel around the oxygen tanks, smoking <laughs> in the casino. Yeah, yeah, you're lucky. Um, lucky you didn't blow yourself up yet. Oxygen's pretty flammable, obviously. I'm sorry. Okay. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chronic bronchitis. What about this? Well, we know what bronchitis is. I'm sorry. I see nobody has a time. Yeah. <laughs> 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 just just go on YouTube and type nobody has time for that. Oh, the fire lady? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was funny. Yeah, thank you. She actually did a challenge for her. <laughs> 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 I got time for that. Is she really? Making, YouTube's making stars. Hey, maybe I'll be next. I'll be on the chiropractic commercial now. I'm going to get sued, go to jail. All right. Maybe I want to decrease those respirations. Makes sense. Scar tissue, right? Yes, scar tissue. Nothing okay, cares. You know care. Lung function can be measured in terms of volume and flows using pulmonary function tests. Volumes can be measured by tidal volume. Uh, this is the air moving in and out as you're sitting here doing nothing, right? As you're just sitting here not thinking about it. 500 milliliters on average. Where is Oh. Okay. So, images like this are really great because it breaks down the actual amount of air that you're just breathing in on a normal, on a regular basis when you're not thinking about it. You see how, in comparison to how much space that there could be in the lungs. So, uh, it really shows you that at any given time you're sitting here, you're only breathing in a little bit and breathing out a little bit and breathing in a little bit and breathing out a little bit. <coughs> you can, however, breathe in a lot more. You can breathe out a lot more. Like as we're sitting here and you breathe out, if you force yourself to, like you're blowing candles out of the cake without taking a deep breath first, you can force that extra air out. Then there's always this part. This part is the amount that's just never going to get out. It's the residual volume. This is why dead people float, right? They don't want to sink a body. <laughs> Okay, so um, I like showing, I like seeing it like this because it really gives a good image of how much lung you're using at any given time. Total lung capacity, obviously, total lungs. Vital capacity, the, the amount that you can totally inhale and totally exhale. Mechanical ventilators, you know what those are. Deep and CPAPs. Adelactasis, 
I know that case is when those little alveoli are collapsed. Pneumonia, this is fluid, often caused by infection. Inflammation of infected air, the accumulation of cell debris and fluid. Um, I think that's good. COPD, we just talked about that. Asthma, asthma is a problem with getting air, bad air out. This is a result of the bronchospasm. Um, now let me go through this slide. Asthma is potentially a life-threatening lung condition resulting in constriction of airways, bronchospasm. Difficult to get air in, more important, get air out, get in the uh, gas trap, and trapped air. Uh, patient breathes the same air over and over, lowers oxygen levels, increase carbon dioxide levels occur. <coughs> See them breathing through pursed lips. They're, they're trying to force it out. I, I think there's a question about asthma, so make sure you know asthma. Inflammatory process causes increased secretions, which is more mucus, blocking stuff. Bronchodilators, um, like albuterol, for instance, the most obvious. Emphysema, we've already talked about this. What is the most common cause of emphysema? Smoking. Smoking. What is the second most co common cause? It is a cause, but I don't think it's second. So I think second is still um, an enzyme deficiency. Because as, our, as we have uh, our cells doing all the work they're supposed to do in the lungs, they're going to create waste. The waste is supposed to get carried away. <coughs> this enzyme is called anti-1-alpha-trypsin. Have you ever heard of this? Mm -hmm. Alpha-1 anti-trypsin deficiency. It's, it's a different type of emphysema, though. Different area of the lungs involved. But a person with alpha-1 <coughs> anti-trypsin deficiency, if they smoke, guaranteed emphysema. Okay, you can see, you can see the constricted bronchiole, all that disgusting mucus coming out. Uh, chronic bronchitis. Chronic bronchitis, in this case, the word chronic has a very specific um, time, to, time frame. Usually we'd say chronic is something like, you know, persistent for more than three weeks, whatever. With chronic bronchitis, um, you'd have to ask a pulmonologist because I don't know what it is. I remember when I first learned it, it was something like a person had to have bronchitis that lasted three weeks twice in a six-month period or three weeks three times in a 12-month period, something like that. But the definition has changed a little bit. But it's very specific for chronic bronchitis. Okay, here's a good one. Pneumothorax. Pneumothorax condition in which there's air outside of the lungs in the thoracic cavity. Causes include stab or gunshot wound coming from the uh, external or internal. Can be life-threatening if not treated with that. Pleural effu effusion. This is a good one. This is a really good one. This is a really good one. Pleural effusion. Pleural fluid in the pleural space. Okay, listen to this. Listen carefully. A pleural effusion is the buildup of fluid in the pleural space between the parietal and visceral pleura. If specifically that pleural effusion, that pleural effusion is pus, that is called empyema. If it's just about fluid, if it doesn't mention pus, we will call it pleural effusion. If it has pus in it, empyema. Okay. Good one to know. Uh, fluids go down because of gravity. Antibiotics, if necessary, move the stuff out. Uh, suction it out. TB. You know about TB? Tuberculosis caused by a mycobacterium. Uh, this is quite a problem. There is now, have you heard of the multiple drug resistant tuberculosis? Uh, that is very dangerous. Normally, what do we treat tuberculosis with? We treat it with like uh, streptomycin, rifampin, isonizid. Um, rifampin is an interesting medication used to treat tuberculosis because it has an interesting side effect. It causes the tears to be orange. Have you ever heard of this, this side effect? So if you see somebody on a subway and they're coughing and coughing and coughing, you see an orange tear run down their face, it could be because they're, they are coughing because they have tuberculosis being treated with rifampin. 
Get off at the next stop. <laughs> Dyspnea, difficulty breathing, tympnea, rapid breathing, cyanosis. We know cyanosis is retraction, using accessory muscles, tachycardia, or a heartbeat, polycythemia, we know that. Smoking, don't smoke. Uh, smoking, I know, I'm sorry. Um, tobacco products are responsible for over 400,000 deaths per year. That's more than all other drugs combined, including alcohol. Don't smoke. Yeah. Uh, okay. Entitled carbon dioxide. Well, yeah, entitled carbon dioxide. <laughs> when CO2 is in the breath. All right, I think I got all the good stuff out of the way. Okay. I thought you were a little earlier. I thought we were going to be really late. That means we can start on the next chapter. See if we had a video. Say things like that. A little hurtful. Not, not. It's not hurtful. I don't care. Some of should tell the American Lung Association that they misspelled acute bronchitis and called it a space. I was going to say, is it two words? <laughs> acute little bronchitis. Oh, look at that. It's just like his dad. <laughs> Sometimes I say it's absolutely just for me. <laughs> I think I feel all black plague. How do you see all these? <laughs> no. Yeah, how easy you see all these? <laughs> I don't see all the videos. Yeah. I'm sad that you I'm see some of those. I have, I have no life. Pulmonary ventilation, or breathing, includes inspiration and expiration, both of which result from changes in the volume of the thoracic cavity. Changes in the volume of the thoracic cavity are driven by respiratory muscles and occur in three dimensions, length, width, and depth. During inspiration, the thoracic cavity increases in volume to accommodate expansion of the lungs. The length of the thoracic cavity is primarily regulated by changes in the shape of the thoracic diaphragm. During inspiration, the length is increased by flattening and descent of the dome-shaped diaphragm when it contracts. During expiration, the diaphragm is elevated as it relaxes and the length of the thoracic cavity decreases. The depth and width of the thoracic cavity are regulated primarily by the intercostal muscles that alternatively elevate and depress the ribs and sternum. 
Ribs and their costal cartilages slope inferiorly as they course around the thoracic wall and attach to the sternum. Elevation of the ribs increases thoracic cavity width. This motion is similar to raising the handle of a bucket. As the ribs are elevated, the sternum moves anteriorly and superiorly, increasing thoracic cavity depth. This motion is similar to raising the handle of a pump. The increase in volume and decrease in pressure in the thoracic cavity, which results from the movement of the ribs and sternum, facilitates inspiration. In the lungs, gas exchange takes place in the terminal portion of the bronchial tree. Alveoli are small, saccular outpocketings of the respiratory bronchioles and alveolar ducts. Each alveolus is about 250 micrometers in diameter and abuts other alveoli to form clusters called alveolar sacs. There are millions of alveoli in each lung. The alveolar wall consists of two specialized cell types. Type 1 cells are thin, squamous epithelial cells that form 90% of the alveolar surface. The larger, cuboidal type 2 cells secrete pulmonary surfactant that coats the inner surface of the alveolus. This surfactant reduces surface tension and prevents the collapse of the alveolus. Pulmonary capillaries form...